Thanks for joining us on another exciting journey into the world of science, right here on the SAT Science Experience. If you enjoy this kind of content, hit like and subscribe. It's the best way to support the channel and keep these episodes coming. Today we are doing a deep dive into a molecule that's generated, well, quite a lot of buzz recently regarding aging. That's the amino acid taurine. That's right. Yeah, lots of discussion around it. And we've got two key recent studies in our source stack, and um, they present a really intriguing picture, maybe even a contradictory one. I'd say so. Taurine is uh, conditionally essential. Our bodies make some. We get some from diet. It's involved in lots of processes. But, yeah, it's role in aging. That's been up for debate, and these papers really highlight that complexity. Okay, let's try and unpack this then. The first uh, major piece we have is that paper from 2023, Singh and colleagues. What was their main idea, their core hypothesis? Well, it was pretty provocative, actually. They proposed that a deficiency in taurine might actually be a driver. A driver of aging itself. Yeah, a fundamental driver. They observed that circulating taurine levels seem to decrease with age in some of the models they looked at, specifically uh, worms and mice. Okay, worms and mice. And they didn't just observe, did they? They intervened. Exactly. That was the next step. They gave these aged animals taurine supplements. And the results? Well, in their models, the results were quite striking. The supplementation seemed to improve various health markers tied to aging. And importantly, they reported it extended the lifespan in both the mice and the C. elegans worms. Right. C. Yeah. elegans. So that sounds, I mean, that sounds pretty compelling on the surface. Low taurine, older animal, boost taurine, better health, longer life. Mm-hmm. What sort of mechanisms did they point to? How might it be working? They linked taurine to several key cellular processes, things known to be involved in aging, like uh, reducing DNA damage, impacting cellular senescence. Senescence, right, the zombie cells. Exactly. Also improving mitochondrial function. Specifically, they mentioned complex one translation, which is key for energy. Complex one. Got it. And supporting stem cell renewal as well. Okay. That definitely paints a strong picture for taurine being important, at least in those animal contexts. But... You know, science moves fast, and our sources include a newer paper, 2025, Fernandez and colleagues. What were they aiming for? Well, yeah, following the excitement, but also some, let's say, conflicting reports, Fernandez's team wanted a clearer picture. They really wanted to use more comprehensive data to see how circulating taurine actually changes with age, focusing specifically on healthy individuals. And they used a different approach data-wise. They did. They looked at healthy individuals across three mammal species, humans, rhesus monkeys, and mice. And crucially, they incorporated significant longitudinal data. Ah, tracking the same individuals over time. Exactly, which is often seen as more powerful for studying aging changes than just comparing different age groups at one time point, you know, cross-sectionally. Makes sense. Okay, so with this robust longitudinal look at healthy aging, what did Fernandez find? Did they see that same age-related drop in taurine? And here's where it gets really interesting and kind of challenges that simple decline idea. Contrary to some of those earlier reports, Fernandez and colleagues found that circulating taurine levels did not consistently decline with age in the healthy groups they studied. Wait, really? Not in healthy humans or monkeys or mice? Generally, no. Levels tended to either increase a bit or stay pretty much the same across the adult lifespan. Mm. There was some variation, you know, depending on sex and species but no consistent drop. Wow. Okay, so in healthy aging mammals, taurine isn't necessarily going down. That's a direct contrast to the Singh observation. It is. And Fernandez's team looked at other aspects too, right. like the variability between individuals. They thought it was actually quite significant. The difference between, say, your baseline taurine and mine might be much bigger than the average change happening within either of us as we age. Uh, okay. So that high variability makes it tricky to use as a simple aging biomarker for any one person. That was precisely their point. It limits its usefulness as a straightforward marker. They also looked at links between taurine levels and things like muscle strength or body weight. And those associations were, well, inconsistent, mm -hmm. depending on age, species, the specific group. So given all that no consistent drop in healthy aging, high individual variability, what was the main takeaway from Fernandez? Their conclusion, based on their data from these healthy cohorts, was that low circulating taurine is probably not a good biomarker of aging. Okay, so, wow. We have Singh et al. suggesting deficiency drives aging and supplements help in animals, and Fernandez et al. saying, hold on, levels don't actually drop consistently in healthy aging mammals, and it's not a great biomarker anyway. 
How do we square these two? Why such different results in our sources? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And the Fernandez paper actually discusses potential reasons for these kinds of discrepancies across different studies. They highlight how sensitive these things can be to, well, study design for one. Like the longitudinal versus cross-sectional thing. Exactly. But also, what biological fluid you measure, plasma versus serum, can give different numbers. Oh, right. The lab methods used to quantify the taurine matter, too. And then there are factors like diet, environment. And, crucially, maybe the health status of the subject. Absolutely crucial. Yeah. Were the animals or people in earlier studies truly representing healthy aging? Or did they have underlying conditions that might affect taurine? The Fernandez study made a point of using healthy cohorts in that longitudinal design over wide age ranges, specifically to try and control for some of those potential confounders. Right, to isolate the aging variable better. That seems to be the goal, yeah. So, thinking about the listener... What does this kind of conflicting research actually mean for understanding aging or thinking about interventions? Well, I think it really underscores how complex it is to find reliable, simple biomarkers for something as multifaceted as aging. It's tough. Yeah. And it shows that even if a molecule like taurine shows promise for improving health or lifespan in specific experimental settings, like the Singh study suggested for their animals, it doesn't automatically mean that the level of that molecule just floating around in your blood is a direct measure of your biological age? Precisely. The effects seem really context-dependent. Your health status, your genetics, your lifestyle. It all likely plays a role. The taurine story in aging, it's clearly still unfolding. A fascinating dive into the complexities and uh, sometimes the contradictions in aging research definitely gives you something to mull over about what really makes a good aging marker. Indeed. Lots to think about. Thanks for listening. And as always, don't forget to like the video and subscribe if you haven't already.